Jay McCarthy. Get bonus. Last year at RacketCon, John Clement said, what about audio at the end of my talk, which was mostly about video? And I said, right now, I just fake it. So what I decided to do over the time between last time and this time, it's not on. It's on now? No. It's on now? Okay. Last year at RacketCon, uh, John Clemens said, what about audio at the end of my talk? And I said, well, I'm, right now I just fake it. But I'm working on something new, and this is that something new. I'm mainly going to be talking about how it works, but I want you to think in the background how this is really a talk about building a domain-specific language and using the Racket tools for the thing that we have been talking about all day today with the Racket Manifesto. So I want to give, want to walk through where I'm going. I'm going to start off talking about the Rico RP2803, which is the NES audio chip. This is a sound synthesizer from the 80s, and it sounds something like this. So that's a really great sound. And we're going to take that sound. What we're going to do is I'm going to show you a, uh, a cycle-accurate synthesizer that I wrote in Racket for this chip. Then we're going to go and talk about some basic music theory, which will allow us to use that chip to actually produce some notes that sound like this. Okay. Now, once we have the notes, now we actually have to produce some art. Now, unlike Ben, I don't know anything about actual art. So what I, everything I learn, I learned from Wikipedia. And so basically what I did is I just went through the music theory part of Wikipedia, read something, wrote a little program about that thing, and we ended up with Beethoven, which produces some music. In case you're wondering, that's the name of this song. Okay? So... Something that's really important about Beethoven is that Beethoven uses the data enumerate library to build a bijection between natural numbers and songs that obey the rules of Beethoven music. This first number is the song, and then down here after the dot, because this is the cons, down there, that's the band that's playing that song. We'll talk about these ideas later. But let's start off with the RP2803. Uh, so what it has is it's a very, very slow processor. It actually ran in parallel with the CPU, and so it's really important to know this number because we're going to do a cycle accurate simulation of it. It has only four things that it can make. It can do two pulse waves, a triangle wave, a noise channel, and it can do seven bit samples. I won't talk about the seven bit samples. Each one of these things produces four bits of audio. Four bits of audio. Okay? So, this right here is the entire simulator for the uh, pulse channel. A pulse channel looks something like this. Okay, so basically what a pulse channel is, is a little rectangle. What we have right here is the simulator for this. So up here at the top, we have something that takes the period of the pulse channel. So basically what, it does, what you have in the CPU is you just tap a little counter. And based on the speed of the CPU, that determines how long you left on that particular channel. And we, so we simulate that. Now, the next thing that we do is uh, it has four different ways that you can turn on the width of the sound. Because basically every sound that you hear, um, you're hearing the frequency and you're also hearing the shape of the wave. So what the pulse channel does is it allows you to have four different shapes. And what I want to get across here is that this is some fairly low level stuff, just dealing with math, ultimately just producing a single four bit number. And so this right here is a graph of what this looks like for a single microsecond. So this is a microsecond runtime of the, uh, of the first duty which is 25%, uh, showing us, basically playing, I think it's a, I think it's an A4, so it's a middle A on the piano. It sounds like this. So that's a whole second, but if I were to, you know, a 60 of that is what we're generating here. And there's four different of these. This is uh, the half, this is the 75, and then this is the rest. And that, fir that last one and the first one, they actually sound the same, so there's really only three different ways that you can do it. The reason that I'm mentioning this is that this, uh, this sound synthesizer has basically a uh, very, very small amount of abilities. You have a very small number of frequencies that you can generate, and you have these little duty channels. And then notice that the sound, which is what the y-axis is, um, the volume, I mean, uh, is restricted. So right now it's generating a 7. Okay. So 
when we actually program the music, what we're going to have to do is on a millisecond by millisecond basis say what we want this little chip to do. And that music that we heard before was actually doing that. Okay? So let's talk about the next thing, which is the triangle. So the triangle generates a wave that's jaggy. And this is the simulator for it. It goes through a very particular pattern, um, going from 15 back down to zero and then up to 15. The triangle also has different periods, um, but the triangle, because of the way that they made the chip, it actually runs a little bit slower. So notice that up here, we take the pulse, uh, the, the second line, we take the period of the pulse, figure out its frequency, and then divide that by two, because it's actually running slower, the triangle part of, this, of the chip, than the pulse did. And, <coughs> um, and we have no volume control in the triangle. We can just turn it on and off. It looks like this, and it always looks exactly like this. The only thing that we can change is how wide the triangle is. And this one sounds like this. Okay. Now the next thing that we can do is we can make noises. Noise is just going to sound like static, and basically they made a very simple 14-bit uh, linear shift feedback register, which is a very simple way of doing random number generation. And this is an accurate uh, implementation of this. One of the things I did for a test suite is that I uh, took an existing NES emulator and made sure that I was generating exactly the same bits as it did. So there's a very interesting test suite that goes along with this. And here's, by the way, what it sounds like. So this is just uh, a very simple one. So we're going to use that to make drums. So that is going to be drums. Now, there's one thing that we can do with the feedback loop, uh, which is that we can shrink the sh linear shift register to make it go from having a 15-bit cycle to a 4-bit cycle. And if we do that, it's going to sound really tinny. Sounds like this. So that's going to sound much more metally. Okay. So, by the way, if you've played Mega Man 2, which you should, in Metal Man stage, they actually use the metal-sounding version for the drums in that stage. It's very cool. Okay. So, this right there gives us um, these, these four different sound sources. Now, <clears throat> I studied the circuit diagram for the chip to figure out how it did the mixing. And it does this very complicated mixing formula, which is represented right here. So, all these numbers are meticulously figured out from looking at the diagrams. And essentially allows us to stitch together all the things. We're ultimately going to be able to produce uh, an 8-bit sound. But those 4-bit channels for each one, they're not just naively combined together. They're combined in this very complicated way. And so when we combine them all together, this is going to be all the sounds that you just heard. Does not sound good. Okay. So to turn this, this synthesizer into something that actually sounds useful, we have to have art. And this brings us to the NES Chamber Orchestra, which is what I call the part of the code, which is my library implementing music theory. So music theory, here's a little crash course. Again, everything comes from Wikipedia. Okay, so tones, those are the things that you hear. They're basically just frequencies. You can look up on, you know, uh, in like a piano tuner, what each key is supposed to sound like. And unfortunately, there's like four notes that the NES can't play. Uh, so we have to make sure they're not allowed to do those. Notes, these people, they have all complicated names. Notes are really just ways of writing down negative exponents of two. So you have you know, one, a half, a quarter, an eighth, stuff like that. A metronome uh, is basically like how fast it's going to be played, right? And so a metronome is just going to be a pair of which note and how many times per minute you're going to have that note. So this right here is something that is a little function called frames in note. So what it's going to do is it's going to take in uh, a note that we want to play, um, and it's going to uh, have the metronome that we're currently working in, and it's going to tell us how many sixtieths of a second that particular note lasts. And once we have this, um, we can combine these things together to know how long to leave on the pulse channel. And um, the knowing the tones is going to have is going to figure is going to tell us which period we want. And knowing how long to leave it on is going to make sure that we can play it for the right amount of time. So once we have this, we can produce something like this. So that starts to sound almost like music. And really, all that's going on is we're making sure that we change the pulse at a certain time. So from here, the next thing that we do is we figure out scales and keys and stuff like that. So scales and keys, basically what they are, are notes that sound good together. And so 
the first step to making music that anyone would want to listen to is to make sure the notes sound reasonable together. Essentially, a scale, the way that I represent it, is as a list of a pair of the tone, for instance, C4, along with uh, what I call the octave. Um, well, not what, I, what an octave is, so, right? Because on your piano, you've got many, many octaves, so I'll say, I want C4 in the fourth octave, or, or a C in the fourth octave, or C in the eighth octave, or something like that. <clears throat> Then, there's all sorts of different kinds of scales. So I wrote this function, well, I wrote, there's this type called scale kind, which takes in a tone and returns a scale. So you can say, I want a scale starting with a C, and there's many different kinds of those. There's this little DSL for writing down these things, define scale, so define scale, diatonic major. And so what we have right here is um, essentially the gaps between the tones for this kind of scale. So a diatonic major, you start with a C, and then you go forward two, and then you go forward two, then one, then two, 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 one. And then that defines a diatonic major scale. There's a whole bunch of these. There's a great list on Wikipedia. Just type it into the program. Bada bing, bada boom. Okay. The next thing is this thing called a mode. Modes are really important because they're related to chords, which are also really important, but we'll get there. So essentially what a mode is, is you take a scale and you do a rotation on it. And as you rotate, when things pop around the other side, they go to the next octave. So if you move to the left, the C doesn't go down, like the C that was at octave zero, it pops back around, but in the next octave. So it goes up higher, makes a, 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 um, a higher frequency sound. Once we have these modes, we can form the classic chords, which are the triads, which are basically just three notes that people think in the West sound good together. And the most common one is the tones that are uh, two deep in the scale, then two after that, then one step after that, which you write down as a zero. So it basically is saying how many, how many steps in between are there. So the first one you skip two, then you skip one, and then you skip right to the next one. And so <clears throat> there's all sorts of different modes and different scales, and these allow us to write down chords. And once we can play chords, we can have sounds like this. So that sounds much nicer because we're, we're now knowing, we're now deciding how to use all three channels, the two pulses and the triangle. We're going to only be doing three part harmonies where we have the two, we have the two pulses, which are going to be playing the melody and the harmony. And then we're going to have the, the triangle, which, because it runs slower, that means it can do, pri it can do more frequencies in the low end of the spectrum. So that means that it's really good for having uh, it be your bass. So, once we do all that, we can now move on to, uh, write it, to figuring out how to actually, like, make an instrument. Because we want different instruments to sound differently, right? Because a piano sounds different than a guitar or something like that. So, obviously we make a little, uh, oh, sorry, there's one more thing. The next thing is the tracker, okay? So we want to be able to write down songs, so obviously we need to define what a song is. So a song is a list of parts, a part is a list of measures, a measure is a list of pulses. Pulses is just the generic term for the thing that you write down on a sheet music. And then we get a pulse, which is how long you're playing it, what the different tones are, what the drum is going to be doing, and whether that beat is emphasized. And a tone is going to be an index into the scale, so like four into the scale or two into the scale, and then whether you want to go up an octave or down an octave or something like that. And so we write this little, uh, there's this little meta language called track, and so you can say, in this scale, play this music. And so this is four notes. Um, there's uh, zero in um, on the fourth octave, two in in the third octave, and four in in the second octave. And so that right there is the sound that you just heard. These are the chords that we just heard a second ago. And so we have this little tracking format to write those down. But now we need to figure out how to define an instrument. And so essentially what an instrument is in my system is a function that takes in how long you want to play for, what tone you want, and it will actually produce the wave sound calling out to the simulator. Now, the key thing here is, is that different instruments should have different shapes, so they're going to use that frame budget that they have to shape things out differently. And so we build a little DSL for defining those. It's mainly based on something called ADSR, which is attack, decay, sustain, and release. This is a classic diagram of this, where basically what we're going to do is we're going to vary our parameters, ramping things up during the attack phase, dropping them during the decay phase, sustaining them in the sustain phase, and then gradually releasing them in the release phase. So doing that is going to be able to make things that sound different. So for instance, here is the DSL for a very basic pulse wave. 
This is going to sound the same that we heard before. Now what we're going to do is we're going to introduce some ADSRing on the volume. So we're going to vary the volume over time, and it's going to make it sound really different. So here's what it sounds like. So it's meant to sound like it's being plucked, like it kind of decays a little bit, right? And so this is the little DSL to write that down. So we have a constant 14, linear, in, linear decrease from 14 to 7, hold at 7, then linear decrease from 7 to 0. And any time we have more than 16 frames, we put all that stuff on the release. Similarly, we can have one that's called natural, where the only thing that we're doing here is any extra frame budget that we have, we're going to leave in the sustain phase. This is going to sound different. Most people think that the second, the first one sounds more like a guitar, and the second one sounds more like a piano, because a piano will continue making the noise after you hit the key if you hold it in. So anyway, so this is our little DSL for defining what individual instruments sound like. Drums are much, much more complicated. Um, essentially what we have right here is little things for controlling that noise channel. Well, the, this thing right here defines a hi-hat. Over here we have a bass. Over here we have a snare. This is uh, a little track for a straight rock beat. And then we can combine those together into a basic drum set that sounds like this. Okay, So that is just that random number generator that we had before. All we're doing with the random number generator is we're turning it on and off really fast at very particular patterns so that we get that staticky crackling noise like the, the cymbals ch hitting together. And obviously, figuring out what sounds good is an incredibly painful process. But you know, you just fiddle with the numbers until it sounds good. As far as I know, there's no good theory of this. Maybe there is, but I don't know about it. So now that we can have instruments and this sort of thing, we get Bittoven. Basically, everything interesting about Bittoven is in Data Enumerate. You can read our uh, soon-to-be-rejected Popple paper about Data Enumerate if you want to know more about it. <laughs> But essentially, what, what, it, what we do is we're building bijection between data sets and the numbers. This gives us that mapping between them. Bittoven works by first picking a time signature. Right now, it just does 4, 4, and 3, 4. It goes from a time signature to an accent pattern, whether we're going to emphasize every other beat, just the start of a measure, uh, or on the off beats. The next thing that we do is we pick a musical form. So for instance, we could pick a melody. Uh, which is, you know, independent parts, or we could have like a double binary where we do A, A, B, B, or, you know, we can do a rondo, which is A, B, A. There's all these different patterns that we're going to use for our parts. Then what we do is we pick a chord progression. Essentially, the only reason that any of these songs is going to sound any good is because of the chord progression. Chord progressions are basically a way of saying, how can you usefully use the chords in the scale? Essentially, what, like, what this means right here, like, let's take this one. It's going to say, use the first chord for a while then switch to using the second chord for a while, then go back to the first one, and then go to the, fi the fourth chord, or the, the, the fifth chord. Now, that's going to give us which notes we're allowed to play during that part of the chord progression. We then have to figure out a way to spread those out across the measure and across the part. And there's this great function that would make Robbie proud called list of length n summing to k with no zeros <laughs> slash e. Okay. So this is the core idea about how to take a chord and split it up. Because it's basically like, okay, I have so many notes, and how do I divide up those notes um, that I'm allowed to use over this space? And this little function, what it does is it enumerates all possible ways of doing that. It's very similar to permutations, but it's quite different than permutation because there's this other constraint of how long you have available. Once we do that, there's this awesome thing which defines a part. Essentially, what a part does is it says, how long do we have? How are we going to divide up the chord pulse, the, the uh, chord pulses? And then we've got to um, pull out one of the many possible rhythms that we could apply. Because inside of a measure, there's, you know, there's, we could do um, a full note or two half notes or a half note and then two quarter notes, etc. There's all these different ways of dividing that. That's much more like permutation, so it's less interesting. From there, we have this honking thing. And so this is a giant, a, a giant uh, enumerate expression for saying, this is just hooking everything together. I want to pick a part. They need to be this length, etc. This thing right here is really where um, all the complicated stuff happens. And essentially, it is what defines what makes this number turn into this data structure. Hold on. 
this data structure right here. So this data structure is the song um, that it is actually playing. All these things right here are the tracks for each of the different parts. This song has four parts, and so it, this is part A, this is part B, C, and B. And then um, it also, this one is emphasizing the first note, and it's in 4-4 four, four time. Now this thing right here, it doesn't say anything about the drums. The band is free to interpret this song using drums however it would like, and that's where this other number comes from. So the other number I call the nestration. So the nestration actually uses that and it determines um, what instruments we'll use, it determines what, uh, drum, what drum pattern we'll use, it determines um, what scale we'll use, etc. And that takes this number and turns it into this over here, which is the data structure determining basically like what the drums will be on each part and those functions up there are the functions corresponding to the instruments that are being played throughout the song. Now at this point, we have now done everything and we can, you know, we can just pick some random songs. So my slideshow just randomly picked this song. And so this is the number, this is the song. I think that's reasonable. Okay, we'll pick another one. This is much faster. One of the things that I do is that I actually have a way to say, to restrict what the enumeration is allowed to do, and those are called styles. So the next one is going to be in the, I think, the sad style. So it slows down the tempo, it uses more minor chords, things like that. But one thing that I think would be fun would be, here's another slow one. Imagine walking through a forest. You're going into the castle of the boss. Okay. Now, obviously, something that's cool is that these are just numbers. So that means that we can take any word, you can, we can type in anything right here, and turn that into a number by interpreting the bytes as a number. Okay, Okay. so Racket is a programming language, programming language. Any more things we should say? Oh, and I just... Okay, so when I hit enter, it's gonna turn, it's gonna do it, <laughs> it's gonna do it instantly and turn that into some music and then play it, okay? That is terrific. Thank you, Jay McCarthy. I hope you know that your side project would qualify for a doctorate at any music theory department in the world. Uh, we have time for one question for Jay, and then we've got to move on. Anyone? Or you can just ask him at lunch. Yes, Sam. Hold on. I'm running. I'm running. I'm eluding. Can you play the actual song from that text? Um, it might be playing. So you can, we can play with it together later. You can just tell me things and we'll pop them in. Uh, thank you again, Jay. That was wonderful. Uh, next up.